do 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 <laughs> hey welcome back to CIT 15 Fresno City College it is week eight and it's the odd stuff the interesting stuff it's the unexpected which keeps us engaged in anything right when it's all humdrum routine uh, run of the mill when it's everything the way it's always 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 been we just kind of tune it out and when something's different it piques our interest we're like what is going on here something is different so for whatever reason I thought I'd throw something different at you that's one of the great secrets of engagement of an audience whether you're engaging with an audience on video or in the classroom or giving a presentation or writing something anytime you want to engage people one of the techniques one of the tricks you could use is to do something odd <laughs> do something different do something out of the ordinary week eight cit 15 i'm glad you're here and uh you know the routine uh interestingly right we're kind of getting into the routine here a little bit so we're going to do two main things in this video i'm going to show you what you should be doing this week that's the first thing, and then we're going to talk content. That's the second thing. So uh, for the first thing, taking a look, and I'm just making sure my recording is running, and it's got sound, and you're seeing the screen. Because one time I recorded an entire video, and all you saw was me the whole video. But it was just the textbook, textbook presentation, so I figured it was good enough. Week 8, uh, CIT 15, assignments. You want to do through all the assignments in Canvas going up through week eight. So let's take a look, see what's on the docket for week eight. Google Translate and programming variables in math. Interesting, so those will be fun. And then also do the discussions. So you should be through week eight on all the assignments. And week eight discussion is TED Talk, Andrew Blum, what is the internet really? So we talked, I think, last week about networks. I remember talking about the two benefits of networks. So that was last week or the week before. And, uh, and so this is a good, good talk. And I think I recommended this talk at some point already. So watch that TED talk and then go comment. Cool. So that's what you're doing in Canvas in my IT lab. In my IT lab, my, my IT lab looks different than your my IT lab because I have the instructor view. So in just one second here, you're going to see kind of something that's more similar to your view. My IT lab's a little slow and sucky, so we just have to wait for it. Uh, we're in week eight, so you should have done the exam for Windows 10. That was week one. And then weeks two through five, you should have done all four exams for Word. And then uh, we're in Excel 3, right? Excel 3, so make sure you do through Excel 3 exam. Excel is awesome. Important to know. Access, you know, just kind of cool to gain a little familiarity with it. Not necessarily super important to know. But through Excel 3, exam 3, and then down here, under these exams also, through chapter eight. That's it, okay? So that's what you need to be doing this week. Now we're gonna jump into content. So the textbook PowerPoint presentation, or the textbook presentation, is managing a digital lifestyle, challenges and ethics. Usually I preview this stuff before I talk to you about it. Today I didn't, because I wanted to keep it interesting for myself. So we're gonna talk about that in a bit. But first, we're going to talk about security and privacy. This is kind of like my week eight kind of a deal. And, uh, and so the first thing you need to know, boom, privacy, bam, gone, <laughs> right? Like we have an unprecedented amount of information about every individual on the planet. Never before, millions of years of evolution, literally like I think six million years of evolution as we've become homo sapiens. Like have we had this kind of data or insight into humans? That's, you know, kind of shocking. And, uh, and so the people who have this data can see things about humanity that have never been seen before. They have greater insight into who, who, how, who humans are and how we act. And so this data, which is being gathered amazingly through technology about all of us, gives us tremendous amount of insights about humanity, right, to some people but it's also really shaping society and, uh, and it has some really important considerations. It's probably not gonna change anything about what you're doing. It might change a few little things, but uh, you know, it's just interesting to kind of look to see which way the wind's blowing and to speculate on what might be coming. 
because uh, the history of humanity is also not only is it you know uh, what not only is it I don't know what the word is studded littered not only is it accentuated not only are there moments of humans being incredible and magnanimous and, and peaceful and generous and kind right tremendous amount of that there's a tremendous amount of that and if you look at books by like Steven Pinker I think that's his name Steven Pinker the better angels of our the better angels of our nature right so there it is the better better angels of our nature why violence has declined what this book really shows you is that you're living in the golden age of humanity. And we also saw this when we looked at the Gapminder website, right? Like never before have humans been healthier and wealthier. And if there's a lot of violence going on, a lot of wars, or if we weren't able to produce crops the way we were producing them, we wouldn't be living as long. So we've never been healthier or wealthier. And there's, ne there's, there's you know, never been less violence, right? Wait, there's never been more violence. Never been less violence. So this is really like humans our trajectory overall has been really progressing so we're doing better and Steven Pinker who's a you know professor at Harvard so he probably knows a little bit about what he's talking about uh, wrote this book if you're into audible books or into reading I'm not into reading I don't learn well from reading I learn well from listening so I listen to books but this is a cool book to check out kind of mind-blowing kind of long but kind of awesome so that's the first thing. Humanity is doing better than ever. And that's also reflected in, uh, you could tell I'm more awake tonight. <laughs> the last couple of times I've been pretty hammered, pretty tired when I've uh, recorded these. You could also check out the book by um, Hans Rosling, Factfulness. And so uh, 10 reasons uh, we're wrong about the world and why things are better than you think. And so this is another book that really speaks to that. You are living in the golden age. Like you got the Willy Wonka ticket. Like, you know, you're probably in America when you're watching these videos. So not only are you like in the best time period of humans, you're also in like one of the best countries. And I'm not just saying that from like, what do they call it? Cultural centricism, you know, uh, ethnocentricism, whatever that is, right? I'm not, well, let's look that up. I'm kind of curious. Ethnocentricism is like, you know, me being evaluation of other cultures according to preconcep con preconceptions originating in the standards and customs of one owns culture, yeah. So I'm not just saying that because like, I'm like, you know, yay. But it's like, literally, when you look at all the countries, when you look at that gap miner website, America has some of the greatest health and some of the greatest wealth. So not only are you living in one of the best times to be alive, you're also living in one of the best places to be alive. So in many ways, throughout the history of humanity, billions of people who've lived, you're like one of the select few who drew the lottery ticket to live in the best period in the best place. So count your blessings. So all that said, Right. History is littered. You know, there's like we've never done better as humans throughout history. And um, and there's all kinds of examples of great human kindness and they're growing. Right. In relation to our travesties. And don't forget. <laughs> right. Like there's also a lot, you know, a lot of moments in history that have been punctuated with humans being absolutely awful to each other. And you could start with like the Roman Colosseum and rent the movie Gladiator to check some of that out and how a sport to watch humans go, you know, fight each other or multitude of wars or genocides or, you know, uh, you know, you could look at like, you know, uh, Wikipedia, Wikipedia genocides, right? Like genocides, you know, just for fun reading. I can't spell apparently. Uh, Wikipedia genocides, that's what I meant. List of genocides by death toll, genocides in history, you know, and it's just like, you know, all these different cases where, you know, people were just massacred by other people. And, uh, and you yeah, know, there's a lot. And so never underestimate also the, both the light and the dark, creation and destruction. That's kind of the nature of the universe. It's also the nature of humans, right? There's light, there's dark, there's good, there's... Un, there's skillful, there's unskillful, there's creation, there's destruction, there's birth and there's death. It gets very philosophical. But, um, you know, as we give up privacy, we've been giving up information. We're talking about security and privacy. More is known about us than ever. How will that information be used? How will it be used? And will it be used skillfully or will it be used unskillfully? Skillfully? Will it be used uh, against your best interests? And so maybe information's gathered about you, 
And maybe corporations are, ga- you know, they are absolutely gathering information about websites you visit, places you frequent. And so let's just hypothetically say that, you know, you're struggling. You grew up in a, in a, a hard environment. You survived a traumatic event or something like this, right? And so you go to get therapy. And I'm a huge proponent of therapy. I mean, and I went to therapy for like many years <laughs> because I survived a traumatic experience when I was a kid, right? I was, was a survivor of a traumatic experience that left me with PTSD, depression, and anxiety. And so I went to therapy. Let's say, you know, in whoever goes to therapy, right? Your phone goes with you. Your phone knows you're in a therapist's office because everything is mapped. Corporations now that you know that you're going to therapy once a week. And then they see, oh, it's been up to twice a week. And then after a couple of years, oh, it's gone back to once a week, right? And then they also see what you're searching for. And so they're recording where you go and they see that you go to therapy and they're recording what you search for. And they see that maybe you have a hard time sleeping at night and they see the emails and the text messages and they hear what you're talking about because Alexa is always listening. And so is Google Home waiting for you to say, okay, Google or Alexa, right? And I can't say it too loud because it'll respond. Right? It's all, and it's all being recorded. And they, they know everything about you. They know your intelligence, your IQ score. They know your emotional intelligence, your EQ score. They know your emotional health. And they know whether or not you visit pornography websites. And then you go to apply for a job. And it's like, say, at Apple or Microsoft or Google. And they look, and just before you even get an interview, you're ruled out. They're like, we're not going to hire anybody who's been to therapy. Yet that is never talked about. That's never said that that's one of, those, one of the practices. Yet at the same time, it's totally logical and rational. Why would a company want to hire somebody who has trouble sleeping, right? Who has text messages and emails where they're angry at somebody else in the text messages and emails on a frequent basis and they don't use kind, communicative, skillful relationship building language, right? They go to therapy, they don't communicate well with others, and uh, you know they, they have trouble sleeping and they look at pornography websites that are inappropriate, right? Too frequently. Uh, and then just you're ruled out. You're, you're, and you don't have certain opportunities. Yeah, and, and that's never discussed, right? Like corporations will never admit to that, but it's rational. It makes total sense because their profitability, their success depends upon them hiring functional people. And so that's what the world is looking like now. And you apply, and there's cases of this. You apply to university, and yet your social media posts have stuff, has something in it which, you know, is not appropriate, and then you just get declined. You don't get accepted to the university you want to go to because of something you posted on social media or because you have wacky YouTube videos where you're doing things which you think are funny, and but they're a little bit off, you know, weird humor. Like even now when I'm recording this video, I'm totally cognizant of what I'm saying and that it could come back and, you know, like if I say it incorrectly, maybe it could reflect poorly on me. So this is the world we live in now. And how do you deal with it? Where do you take your stand? You have to, and so, you know, just uh, to finish this corollary, you have to be willing to stand on trial in front of the world for all of your actions, right? And you, you have to be able to stand up and say, I did that and I'm, I'm accountable for it and this is who I am and I'm not embarrassed and I'm not ashamed about it and this is why I did it. Because that information is now all known. It is now all known. It's known. Okay? So you have to be willing to stand up in front of a tribunal at any time and be held accountable for your actions. Now, most of the times you won't, that that will never happen. And and the ramifications of your online actions and the amount that you're being tracked and everything you do in your life will be quiet and behind the scenes. And doors just won't or they will open for you based upon some algorithms that determine you are or are not the right person for a certain door to open or not open. But that's the world. That's the world we live in now. So in China, they have something called the social credit system. And it's explicit in China, right? And the social credit system is all about social credit system China, right? Like you could check out this video. Ooh, and let's look at the Vice video. Oh, here it is, right? Vice always does good videos. Here's the Vice one. And so they're explicitly tracking people, and then you're given a score. 
And if you aren't a good citizen, if you spit and a camera through facial recognition sees you spitting on the city street or you litter on the city street and there's cameras all over and the facial recognition identifies, oh, Todd littered, right? Your social credit score goes down. And if your social credit score goes down enough, you lose things. So you might go and be like, I want to buy a plane ticket. I want to go see my relatives and be like, you can't buy a plane ticket. Your social credit score is too low. You have to take the bus. <laughs> True story. That's, that's what it is in China, right? So it's a punitive social credit system. If you aren't a good citizen, you lose things. In America, I think it's kind of the opposite. It's a, it's a rewards based, I think, in some ways. So the better, I don't know if that's true, but we don't have it explicitly like in China. So that's, that's one thing to check out. The next thing to check out is to take a look at uh, uh, Edward Snowden. Because when this was all starting to shape up, when this was all starting to shape up, this guy used to work for the government. He came out and he stole a whole bunch of documents and he's a traitor, according to the government, because he leaked confidential information. He calls himself a whistleblower. He said, look at what we're doing. It's not right. And, uh, and so this one here... NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden, I don't want to live in a society that does these sorts of things. And he's like, I don't, you know, if you look up like Edward Snowden quotes, Edward Snowden quotes, I think I have it right here in the PowerPoint presentation. Here it is. Uh, Even if you're not doing anything wrong, you're being watched and recorded. And the storage capability of these systems increases every year consistently by orders of magnitude. They can use a system to go back in time and scrutinize every decision you've ever made, every friend you've ever discussed something with, and attack you on that basis, to derive suspicion from an innocent life and paint anyone in the context of a wrongdoer, right? I don't want to live in a world where everything that I say, everything I do, everyone I talk to, every expression of creativity or love or friendship is recorded, right? So now he doesn't. (laughs) He lives in Russia, well, and everything there is still recorded. You know, and so that's the next thing to know about. And then the next thing you want to know about, and we've already discussed this a little bit, is Netflix has the social dilemma. And so you need to go watch this movie because this movie really kind of breaks it out, like how much we're being impacted by all of this tracking. And so that's security and privacy in a nutshell. Okay, that's kind of like the where that's the state of the current. That's the current state of affairs of security and privacy. And so security and privacy work in, in inverse, next thing you know. And I could give you more security, but you're gonna, you, I'm going to have to take away privacy. Or I could give you more privacy, and I'm going to have to take away security. So let me illustrate that with an example, right? Like, you, we can offer people 100% privacy, and we aren't going to have as much security. Somebody could come into the airport, and they could have a coat on with guns underneath. And because we have 100% privacy, we don't... We don't frisk them. We don't, they, we don't ask them to walk through a metal detector. 100% privacy. Whatever they want to do, they get to do. 100% privacy. We have less security, right? Because people could just walk onto planes with guns under their jacket, okay? Uh, opposite mm-hmm. end, we could have more security and less privacy. We could have more, more searching, right? More background checks. And so we have less privacy, but we have more security. And not only for getting on airplanes, but for everything. And so the more privacy we give up, the more security, you know, in some senses we gain because we're tracking everything. So at the extreme, if we tracked everything about everyone, where everybody was at in every moment, what everybody said at any time, right, you know, we would have a lot more security. And if we had some way to analyze all of that data, because we could see people who were, and we, we psychographically profile people, we could see like, oh, this person, you know, just loaded a bunch of guns into their car and they're you know driving to really to rock concert right like you know we have less privacy so we we know all that about everybody and if somebody did something like that we would know it but we have more security so there's a trade-off inverse relationship between security and privacy that's kind of like the next thing to know so this has all been going on for a while, and it's super interesting, and you should totally check out this Edward Snowden talk. You should totally check out China's social credit system, and you should totally check out Netflix, The Social Dilemma. All right, so check all those things out. And then you should also reflect upon how in history there have been times where humans have not treated other humans well. And so I'm just looking to see if I have any pictures of that. Maybe in next week, maybe I take them out. 
Um, but, you know, like you just have to think about the Holocaust in Germany, um, right? Uh, and if you're the wrong, you know, or the, the Pol Pot regime, I think it was in Cambodia, right? If you're the wrong category of person at different times in history of humanity, they wanted to get rid of certain categories of humans, and they have. They've had genocides against certain categories of humans. So if you revealed what kind of per human you are, which we've all done, it's easier to start to discriminate against. All right, so it's an interesting world. You can check out some of like how you're being tracked by going to Google location history, right? So it'll tell you what day where you were, if that's enabled on your phone, you could see it. This is a great movie, The Lives of Others. So kind of about Eastern Europe and a, a Stasi police officer who monitors and tracks people and kind of, you know, gives a little insight in historical context of you know, central power tracking its citizens. And then there's just like a bunch of other TED Talks about security and privacy. Here's an example of, you know, Google uh, timeline showing me where I went and when. <laughs> kind of interesting, right? It could show you where you went and when. Where you went, when. So that's, uh, that's pretty much security and privacy. I'm just checking through this to see if there's anything else I wanna, I want to mention. All right, protecting your privacy um, is hard. And uh, you know, you could Google it to find steps if that interests you, how to protect your privacy. Some basic things would get like a VPN, virtual private network, and keep your high risk personal data uh, confidential. If somebody calls you up, says they're from your bank, be like, yeah, whatever, right? Or they send you an email and it's supposed to, be, you know, never click a link in an email. Never give out, you know, your social security number, your driver's license number, your mother's maiden name. Um, you know, these pieces of data that identify you, you really want to be careful about giving them out. Your email address, your phone number. I've been in places where it's like, they're like, can I have your phone number? I'm like, why? Why, why do you need my number? <laughs> you know, and if I don't feel like they need my number, I'll just give them a false one. Right? Like if it's not for anything that I care about. Um, so you just got to be circumspect and be start to be a little bit vigilant and careful with who you share your information with. If somebody calls you up, like never trust them. I came into, I came across two scams this week. Um, so, you know, it was for, I was looking to buy a trailer on uh, eBay or something like that. I can't remember what website, but you know, there are two, two scams. So that's, uh, that's uh, privacy and security. And uh, there's some good content there. Go check it out. Next thing we're going to talk about is uh, chapter eight. And like we're doing is we're breaking these up into two different videos. I will see you in the next video where we're going to do that.